Hey everyone, welcome back. This is Abinov, your host. Today you're in for a very special treat because we are taking it back. Back to 2019, the year we all miss. Pre-pandemic times, when I first started doing podcasting, I really wanted to be doing live streaming shows. So what you're going to find in this episode is one of those shows from 2019. So let's dig into it. Make sure you check it out that it's also on YouTube. There's a video component to this. We had multiple camera angles, real fancy stuff right when I wanted to get started in this whole podcasting space. So I would really appreciate it if you guys check this out. Let me know what you think. If you think I should bring these back or continue doing the episodes that I've been doing as of late. Thank you. Let's get into it. We talked about how actually it's difficult because a lot of conversations that we have day to day are very surface. Right. Right. And you need to be able to probe somebody a little bit deeper. And I think people, I I don't know, that would be my takeaway would be like, if you're trying to get into a relationship with somebody, you need to orient yourself first. Right. That's number one. Thank you for being here today and, and, you know, being my first guest on the podcast. You know, this has been a fun setup for me. It's been in the works and really excited to give it a test run. This is your very first show, yes? It's the very, very first show. I'm here for the birth of it. That's for the birth you're you're the man. That's right. You're the man of the hour. <laughs> awesome, man. What have you been up to? What have you been thinking about lately? Oh, we've got a couple of different topics we can talk about. Uh, yeah. We talked about one of the ideas I was thinking about lately was a relationship algorithm. Um, yeah, tell me about that. End. What are you thinking about? Well, I'm just thinking What's about What's your crazy yeah, mind yeah. stirring up there, Bradley? <laughs> yeah. Crazy is the nice way of putting it. Yeah. Um, We're all just crazy. the idea that if things run according to algorithms, if the, if the world runs according to rules, sure. shouldn't relationships do the same thing? And you go, of course they do. Um, people pay a lot of money for relationship courses and there's counselors and everything else that supposedly know these rules, right? And so then I thought, well, what about the process of getting into a relationship itself? Meaning when two people just suddenly say, oh, I'm attracted to you. And then where do they go from there? How does it go from the beginning all the way to the end where they're bonded, so to speak? Meaning they're growing together as people. And I thought, Maybe Where's the point that, that yeah. you go from strangers to... I think I want to date this person. Is that what you're yeah. saying? I'd say strangers to infatuation, meaning that initial excitement, and then you start dating them, and all of a sudden it's like you're excited to see them all the time, and yeah, you fair just enough. can't get enough of them. Mm. And then eventually, my impression is, according to my reading so far, eventually that develops into bonding, which is a different uh, uh, neurochemical. It becomes oxytocin, if I remember right, Okay. which is a bonding chemical. It's the same one that's given off when moms have babies. Like There's vast amounts of just going So crazy. that creates the bond between the mother and the child. Exactly. And so the oxytocin starts being released more, my, according to what I understand, between one and a half and two and a half years after you start dating. You're saying that it takes that long for a bond to happen? Uh, it takes that long for the initial rush chemicals to wear off. Ah, uh, so you're saying to see if long-term sustainability, if you're mm-hmm. like past the... Um, phase of you know initial relationship yeah. jitters so to speak sure it's going to happen after roughly yeah, it's been one and a half and two and a half years wow yeah and, and it's just the idea then that now you're going okay now I know this person as they actually are not the infatuated ooh I'm so excited every minute of every day for you you know and so I thought okay that's probably step one you know and make sure you understand the rules of infatuation how they work and recognize that they aren't the same thing as bonding mm. You know, you can be infatuated with somebody and think they're absolutely awesome physically and you're going crazy to be with them. But then in the long run, they don't have any, you know, they don't have long-term goals like you do. Yeah, fair enough. You don't have the same idea about anything. And yet that initial physical rush is still there. And I think a lot of people mistake that for long-term compatibility, which isn't really true. You might get lucky, maybe not. So how do you even begin to think about, I'm going to build an algorithm that is going to allow me to find a compatible match. Because, I mean, sure. a lot of these algorithms potentially claiming like the Tinders and the, um, I don't know all the other ones, but right. there's a, that's the most common one I know for sure. Um, and there's tons of them out there now. Sure. All claiming that they have a algorithm that will potentially find you your, your uh, match. So why haven't you pursued that? Why do you feel like you have yeah. something special? I think they're ignoring the obvious biology component because it's too inconvenient for them to do, address it. Because it's example, hard to globally spread it, no? No, no, just because some of the stuff that's pragmatically difficult from a business point of view. Speak um, that in simpler terms. Uh, are you familiar with the major histocompatibility index? No, Brad. No, Bradley, I'm not. He's just talked about, dog. <laughs> He's just making up words. Making I know up you are. Words, I know that's man. real, Come Brad. Come on now. Come on, I know that's real. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Them's just jokes. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, the MHC histones are these big molecules that your DNA is wrapped around. 
as NHC, he, MHC, MHC. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so this index determines the signature of your immune system. And so in a very famous test, they gave, uh, they had men not wear deodorant and wear a shirt for a while. So they'd sweat on it. So it mm. kind of smelled like them subtly. They would give these shirts then to women just and like say... like average day wear shirt. Yeah, just average wear shirt. Okay. And they go, okay, which of these men are you attracted to and why? I'd absolutely love to hear from all of you. So make sure you reach out to me anywhere that you're on on the internet. Just look for The Real Abinov on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, anywhere that you are, including TikTok. I'm there and I want to hear from you. Thank you again. Let's get back to the show. So and women would, would sniff the, the shirt. Without ever having seen the guy or anything else. Okay. They don't know anything about the guy other than the smell. What kind of women volunteer for this, first of all? People have to get... Questionable. They make the college kids do these experiments. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, you're a psych one student. I, Come I, sign up. How do you advertise for that? Seeking women in <laughs> their late teens and early 20s to sniff a t-shirt. Who don't mind the smell of a manly man. Yeah. Sure. They all put right. a picture of a cowboy on it. I don't know, something... Monetary, probably. <laughs> That's right. Probably economic. That's yeah. right. All righty. So. Oh, well, so the women selected overwhelmingly men who had an MHC signature that was a certain distance away from their own on some plot, meaning that they would be optimized for the immune system of their offspring. So there's something that points out that there's like a connection one for mm-hmm. one, like you have a match. This is your MHC match. Mm. And this MHC processing is going underneath Hold the on. conscious level. The hell is MHC stand yeah. for? Major. May oh, hold on here. Major histo histo. Uh, there you go. Okay, what is this? Wow, that's quite a word. Major histo compatibility complex. All right. Wow. Okay, I've never heard of this. Yeah, wow. it's, it's pretty cool. It's a signature of how you how strong and robust your immune system is. It's a signature of what you will find to be. The foreign agent. So it says it's a genetic system oh, there you go. that allows large proteins mm-hmm. in immune system cells to identify compatible or foreign proteins. Okay. Compatible or foreign proteins. Hmm. It allows the matching of potential organ or bone marrow donors with recipients. So this is basically saying what is inside of your DNA if I introduced something foreign, will it does it know that it's a foreign thing? Okay. Yeah. Or, or does it think it's part of its system? That's right. Because if it's a foreign thing, it will so it'll kill attack it. And get it'll rid kill of it. it. That's right. Because that's your immune system. But if mm-hmm. it's... So it's almost like... So if I understand correctly, it's like um, there are certain keys that will open up certain locks and we're yeah. saying, you know, there's a subset of these keys that exist that, you know, they're known to fit in yeah, these locks. Those are, those are exactly what your immune system is, what mm. it recognizes. Quite interesting. Okay. If you Google the T-shirt test, it might be a little bit easier. It's yeah, let's look more, it up. Why not? Forward. T-shirt test. Why not? There you go. Sweaty T-shirts and human mate choices, the very first lead. There you go. Yeah, and so I'm thinking that we have a, a genetic test, which these days are very inexpensive. Yeah. People pay an initial fee up front for the site. And so then they go, here, we're going to get you somebody that you know automatically. You will have that initial first blush toward. Okay. You're going to be near there. You're going to go, oh, wow, I find them attractive. We've all seen this. We go someplace like a party or something. You look at somebody and go, wow, they're attractive. And you go, why? Well, sometimes it's because they're bubbly or they're pretty in some external sense or whatever. But sometimes there's something else. Like a factor, you go, I don't know why it is, but I feel really attracted to that person for no extra reason that I should know of. It's things like this. They're factors that are unrelying or conscious activity. And so right there, that's going to boost your attraction toward the person. What do you think about, I feel like so many people just have a standard basically in their head created of what type of person they think they want to date. All right. Right. So I think what, what people are doing when they look at like, you know, a dating app, they're just looking at, well, physically I'm pretty sure I'm attracted to this person because Mm -hmm. of X, Y, and Z criteria that I have. And then really there's nothing beyond that on an app. Maybe they get a description or something, but who knows? Who knows? Who knows? But, and also you don't know if that's real or if it's doctored or if whatever. So you're saying this is one of those things that scientifically could potentially be a factor. But but I wonder, now this is at a level of, uh, you know, your genetic. Yeah. But I wonder if if there's any studies done or any correlation to say, okay, what you find attractive genetically or what your system thinks is attractive, mm-hmm. how, much of that, the, the, how much of that is actually like 
a mismatch or a match of what you believe to be your ideal mate based on physical attributes, perhaps, perhaps personality traits that you find right. viable. Hmm. I wonder. Yeah. I don't know if we even have that much knowledge yet. Yeah. My autogenetics has figured that my impression is it hasn't, but what do I know? But that'd be cool if your algorithm yeah. does work. To, well, and that's the thing is new mm. technologies like that come online. We could use them. Yeah. I was thinking MHC is first. Facial symmetry is second because it's shown that people have a, more f- symmetric faces are more attractive. Okay. Which means you could sit there and do an analysis and go, this person is, I don't know, 65% attractive, whatever that means. And this other person is 90% attractive. Right. Well, like like our speaker we were listening to at, said last night, everybody tries to date 25% above their grade. Right, right. So we That's can actually match these people within some kind of variance. So it won't be 25%, but maybe we can put you, you know, close enough that everybody goes, oh, okay, that person's, yeah, okay, I'd date them. Yeah. And so now automatically this will help prevent mismatches. Um uh, and so uh, there's also things like we have lots and lots of psychological batteries these days that I Say, think are what, is, what does that mean? Uh, psychological tests that somebody can be given. Okay. That I think would show a lot more about like psychological them. Analy- analytic tests to determine. Yeah, like the the common ones, what's called the Big Five inventory. Okay. A very standard psychological test to see things like a personality type, so then you can plot that in five okay. dimensions. Got. It. Uh, it's things like uh, was it conscientiousness. Yeah, five. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, the five. Um, it's called like the big five inventory. I remember they call it. Let's look it up. Oh, uh, say, so what do you think it could be? They put it in their big five. Big five personality. There you go. Okay. Yeah, so this is measuring five very important personality tra- traits that they think are like core basis in vector okay space. here we go we got openness yeah right we got conscientiousness extroversion agreeableness and neuroticism neuroticism, neuroticism is like negative well my impression is it's this a tendency to be a little too uh to have an irrational action or belief okay that is intransigent and i think that's it i'm not okay. sure that... let's look it up well, I guess neurotic person is having... Having... <laughs> okay, well, that's a great definition. Self-defining. Oh, there you go. Individuals who score high neuroticism are more uh, likely to have... More likely than average to be moody and to, be, and to experience such feeling as anxiety, worry, fear, anger, frustration, envy, jealous, guilt, depressed, mood... I think they're everybody, the life of the party. every yeah, they're the life of the party. But everybody has a level yeah. of neuro. So these is these are traits that exist in all of us, but it's just a degree a of degree which of them, yeah. that you. Well, apparently, um, I, I completely missed the find neuroticism a few minutes ago. So I that's apologize okay. For that. Well, that's why we have Google. That's why. That's why. We that's why Google we're not kids. we're not trying to just put stuff out that's not that's factual right. here. We check our stuff. We check our stuff here. You know. No, but yeah. So and the idea that is these are the five bases. Like you can construct somebody's personality by looking at where they are in each of these dials. So how would you, I feel like some companies though, haven't they tried like, for, I, I don't know, there's got to be platforms that are charging a little bit more premium mm-hmm. for their services, right? And they must be charging sure. uh, or having you maybe take some sort of a, a disc analysis or a personality trait analysis assessment mm-hmm. and then mapping those as part of their broader algorithm. I know? would think so, but have you seen them? No, I haven't, but I, That's but I'm saying, but I don't, maybe somebody else is and I don't know it. I don't, I haven't also done the extensive amount of research mm-hmm. to find out if they are or not. That's so, true. No, me so either. I can't say that either way. Yeah, maybe um, they are. I know the basic free ones aren't because I've been on a few of those. But maybe if you're doing like eHarmony, which is a little more like detailed, I know they charge more. So maybe they are. Okay. That Dr. Neil Patrick Harris or whatever his name is. <laughs> so recap for me. Step one yeah. would to build an algorithm to decide on yeah. how you would so find a mate. So if we're looking down the algorithm, the first step is to find the right mate. Okay. This is or the, find a person that you can then analyze to see if they're your mate. Right? Yeah, okay. exactly. You're trying to get a filter for who do I want to be with. Okay. Which is all everybody's ever doing. They're just not doing it very well. And so you go, okay, how can I do this? First, look at the biology. It's like a layer cake. The bottom layer is the biology. Yeah. So you got your major histocompatibility index. Got or, it. I'm sorry, complex. You have your um, facial symmetry to see how close you'd be to somebody else, you know, in terms of symmetry wise. Uh, I thought that was, oh, and the, third, the personality tests. Okay. Now, on top of the personality are going to be things like goals. I mean, if you have friends who you go, hey, my goal, long-term goal in life is to travel the world, and your partner's long-term goal is to sit at home because they hate traveling, Yeah, that's big enough of a problem, it might become an issue. 
And so these are the longer term things. So you're going from this base biology of, okay, your hormones match theirs. to at the top of it is here's our long term goals, where we're going with our lives, our attitudes about really big topics. And then just underneath that is their personality in general. And so my hypothesis is that if you match these across multiple people, you know, you could actually construct this in a sense. You could do a much better filtering mechanism from all the compatible or all the people in the world to my optimum compatible partner. Or at I mean, least local optimum, but maybe not global. What's the what's the least I guess I should say, what's the what's the most rapid way of prototyping and testing this? How could we how could we do this? I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Blossom Media Studio. Thank you so much for creating and distributing my podcast and taking away literally every single thing that's involved with podcasting so I can just spend the time to talk to my guests and create great episodes. Well, I was wondering, I've never t- seen somebody do the MHC test, but I was wondering like what's the genetic test? What's the test cost for an MHC test perhaps? Yeah. And then and then also like you'd have to have the ability to interpret it, you know, perhaps mm-hmm. and all that, all the other so stuff. So what you need is somebody to build an engine that would graphically take it and put it into like some kind of, okay, here's your value on A, here's your value on B, C, D, spit it out, put it out graphically to the web page to show people this is somebody that's compatible for you. Now, what's interesting is if you constrain this tightly, you might not have very many compatible matches. We're not just looking for one in a hundred. We might be looking at one in 10,000 people that match across all these dimensions. I guess that's a lot of data to collect. Yeah, and well, the thing is, it's not that. It's that since you're looking at one in 10,000, your potential mate could be living 180 miles from here or something. And you're going, dude, why can't well, you find somebody in San Diego? Well, because it, you know you wanted a very good fit. You didn't want just, it's okay as a fit. You want a great fit. What about just getting people a good fit? So you do that. You could just like add, a bargain relationship you them, algorithm. Like, yeah, <laughs> for $10 a month, you get somebody we'll get you, you can tolerate. <laughs> You, they won't kick your ass and you won't kick theirs, so it's cool. <laughs> Can you imagine? I love that. Can you imagine tearing? What kind of mate do you want? Yeah, I want the premium, you know. That's I want right. this full <laughs> service package. And it's like a Rolls Royce or a Tesla. Yeah, wow. Yeah. But you know what? Maybe well. it's not so crazy that you're, we're talking about this, honestly. No. Well, honestly, you're thinking you're about all the that data generates. that we're already yeah. collecting. Sure, why not? You know, it's just a matter of time. Mm-hmm. It's, not a, it's not a matter of, you know, whether it's possible or not. It's just when. Right. It's just a matter of when. And and then that's a good way to capitalize on yeah. it is to, you know, tear it. Why not? Well, we've talked about this just briefly, you and I, before. Just um, I think about the idea of how much similarity do you want to have with your potential partner and how much difference is there? So you have novel things to each bring. I guess, uh, 100%. yeah, the similarities would be near, um, you know, core values. Mm-hmm. Um, things, that, things that are like along that nature. Sure. And... Probably differences in like, uh, ideally would be where you lack, they mm-hmm. pick up. Sure. But I don't know. Yeah. But you could optimize that. You right? can optimize yeah. that. You can sit there and go, give me all the qualities of person A and person B and they overlap 80% and each one's making up what the other one doesn't have. And, and there's a little variance out there that, you know, that each of them brings in separately. Yeah. And so you could sit there, you could maybe do this with big data with all kinds of things from whether or not they spend their time in parks, because if you have GPS data on them, you could tell where they're spending their time, you know, to whether or not they drive long distances because somebody that hates You know, I was distances. thinking about what you just said, actually. Yeah. So you're saying taking the data that's already there, like geo data that exists yeah. from your cell phone in your pocket all day. Sure. Which, you know, at some point is going to be utilized for the, to the somebody highest will. bidder, sure. right? Like, I mean, data eventually is all, if you're going to make money off, you have to sell it. Mm-hmm. So somebody's going to, utilize that data and or at least maybe test that's a good point they can figure out all these traits yeah what are your traits i can access based on your geolocation oh huh, inter- you're on a college what kind of time. pattern is it like yeah. how often do you like go to certain yeah. places how active rest- or sedentary are you yeah oh yeah if you're moving or not right because mm-hmm. a lot of people are so attached to their phone to their hip you can definitely track you can tell exactly. or even like check this thing out this thing's you know tracking my movement oh, yeah. all the time hey you need to stand up hey you didn't mm-hmm. do you know or whatever very true. Well, a matter of time before you start pulling that salient information out. And it sounds so nefarious, but if people what? don't mind it. Huh? What's the word? Nefar- bad. <laughs> bad. <laughs> threatening. Sounds bad. Yeah, all right. Um, it sounds so threatening, but if you think about it, what if it really could help you find that bright person? You know, when you sit there and go, well, oh, I have water. Well, I'll give you some more water. Oh, thank you. Maybe, can we please have some water? Thank you. That's our uh, <clears throat> our behind the scenes production assistant. Produ- oh, first producer, Mimi. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, 
Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and you sit there and think, what's the optimum? If you go, if the purpose, everybody has these good purposes. She wants your glass. Oh. She doesn't want to come in the frame. W- waving at me. No, oh, she just doesn't it. want to come into the frame, so I oh. get it. All good. Um, we all want the same things, right? We all want connection. The problem is we're trying to sort a haystack and get a needle out of it. You know, at worst, we're trying to score, sort, you know, a thousand haystacks and go, where's the needle, the, the right person? Now, of course, it's possible you can go with somebody that's okay. But if you're saying, I really want the right person, it's a lifelong thing. Yeah. Well, then maybe you do pay. I, I'd gladly pay for it. I mean, it's I'd worth it. I'd pay good money for it. It's worth it. Yeah, if you go, you're going to tell me you're going to find me an incredibly compatible person for the rest of my life. Who doesn't want that? So it's one of those things that I feel that that once you have the data, yeah, <clears throat> can be done. Sure. But today, how can we how can we potentially like find, let's say, you a mate? Right or or you know what's I guess what's the what, what's the wireframe version of this that we can do you know that's because I'm trying to think right. actionable what's possible you know well I'm sure they have the big five inventory almost online you can probably I think that's open source now actually yeah so you go to take it and just put it into a thing and it analyzes the data with a script within well how the way you write a day or less sure. a couple hours right and you go well then okay now I, I can get the big five so that gives me a personality thing. But now I'm still kind of just competing with, you know, Neil Patrick Harris. I keep saying that. I know it's like, was it Neil Warren something, something? I don't know. I, the I guy from eHarmony. Oh. And who, so who, the, who? Guy, the old guy who keeps saying that he's the guy, you know, so many matches. Oh, thank you, miss. So there's so many. It's eHarmony, Dr. something, Neil Patrick Harris. That guy. eHarmony guy? Oh, there it is. Dr. Dr. Neil, Neil Clark, Clark Warren. Warren. You know, Dr. Neil Patrick ne- Harris. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the guy from... Yeah, how um, I Met Your Mother. Yeah, How I Met Your Mother. After How I Met Your Mother, that, he started a yeah, website. Yeah, for sure. I think that's... Oh, Okay, okay, that's great. <laughs> yeah, so, but so, then you're just competing on the software. You're going, okay, how? Can yeah, I who's got the somebody? better? Who's got the better algorithm? Yeah, so you're gonna have to do better. You have to do more than that somehow. Um, which also leads me to, I'm kind of going, okay, well, maybe those MHC tests aren't that far away because I don't know if they can do them right now or not. Um, because I know they have, you know, sequencing for like a hundred dollars, and that's twenty three of me, and they'll tell you all kinds of stuff about your genome. Like, well, I can't believe this oh, the is the ancestry any... stuff you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. I can't believe that this is any more than that. Have you done one of those? No. No. I this feel skeptical. Kind of I feel skeptical about yeah. giving that kind of um, genetic information out. That's mm-hmm. kind of like you're volunteering to basically be on a, on a database of, sure. uh, where they can scan you. I don't know. I'm sure eventually it might be unavoidable. It's close. Did you hear about the guy who just got arrested for a 40 year old crime? No. He What's got this? arrested. Is somebody's like I think over in Indiana. Yeah. And he gets arrested. Um, the way they got him was because they had DNA from the crime scene from like the 90s when they couldn't even hardly sequence DNA. And it had been saved all these years. They check it. Now they're at the point where they can do a phylogenic, which means they're talking about the, ex- the behavior that is expressed as a result of the gene. So, for example, you might have the gene for uh, two different eye colors. Yeah. Which one's actually going to pop out? And we wanted the other, and that's called the phylogeny, the the expression of the gene. And so they took his, they were able to phy- phylogenically analyze his data, his DNA, and literally say, he's about this height, he's about this race, he's about this build. They built a composite of the guy, without even like having ever seen him. There were no. That's witnesses. crazy. What's this case called? Um, oh, I don't know. I think it was trying man arrested in thirty year old cold case, um, something like DNA. Because when they found the rest of his DNA, um, the, I mean, I started, they checked it. Uh, there it is. Yeah. CBS. Yeah, that's Murder. It. Yeah. They literally, this girl was killed, and they literally took to the DNA and compared it and said, we don't have his file, DNA on file because he hasn't mm-hmm. done anything. Yeah. However, they took, like, again, it's one of these public databases, I think, the, the Ancestry.com database, and said, here's somebody that must be, I think they said it was his cousin. Like, he's related to him. Right. And he said he lives in this area. And he has this build, he's this race. They just looked around for that person and said, hey, do you have a cousin named so-and-so? And they, yep, I do. Wow. They tracked him down through his relatives that had never done anything wrong either. They were just in the database from doing like the ancestry of the 23 Me. Right. That's amazing. It's pretty insane because then you're going, this means that let's say, for example, I committed a crime. Even though well, I'm not in any database of DNA, they would literally have that now by looking at, say, my mom's DNA if she had ever done 23 Me. Yeah. And so very soon, I'm like, well, how could you ever hide from authorities under certain circumstances now? It doesn't seem like it. You know? It's got to be a way. <clears throat> There's always a way. It's always a way. I've seen, like, Dexter and 
Forensic Files. Oh yeah, yeah. I Dexter was a do. good show, man. <laughs> but it was super repetitive. Yeah. You know, but good show. Yeah, I'm, I'm only on season three. Oh, you you haven't even finished this? Mm-mm. Oh. I'm only oh. now on season three. Yeah. Oh. Oh boy. They just caught the Bay Harbor Butcher. You got to check out Ozark yeah. next. Oh yeah. Okay. I think I think that's a good show on Netflix. <clears throat> you should check out. Yeah, that does sound pretty cool. Yeah, it's a cool show. I think because just of your nature of your interest in like you know oh, being yeah. real precise with stuff. Very Marty tactically Bird, minded. Very tactical guy. I think he's a good character. So how far have you thought this thing through, man? Well, and then I thought, okay, because the algorithm was primarily for my own use. I'm not necessarily trying to start a business with it. Okay. Just the idea, though, that if I had this, it would be awesome. It would be awesome. Because I'd pay them. I'd, I'd, I'd yeah. pay somebody $10,000. So you could tell me I was going to find a partner that we're happy with each other within a year using your system, or you'll give me my money back. Here's $10,000. I'd pay you this Because morning. really, what's been the challenge for you? Why haven't you found somebody that... Okay, first off, That's I just want to take a step back, yeah. and I want to... Just for the people that would listen to this, I want to point out, you know, Bradley is very incredibly bright person. He's got, I mean, if you look at him, how society would, you know, defines people that are credible, PhD, masters, I mean, six degrees in all, the guy's incredibly qualified. And in debt. And, well, <laughs> sure. But, yeah, actually, you know what? That's real. That's right. That's that loan real. servicing wants my money every That's right. month. That's right. And actually, you know, you've, you've seen quite a bit. Um, through your profession and just being a professor, you know, there's a lot you see in the universities. <clears throat> it's true. Yeah, so I, 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 I don't know. Like you, it's not like you're not exposed to enough people in the day. You know, you're getting a ton of people coming yeah, in and true. out from all different backgrounds. So, I mean, what has really been hard for you um, in determining, you know, um, or finding a match? I want to take another quick moment to thank our sponsors, Podcast Backdrops. If you do any kind of video content or pictures online or you're doing any sort of selling over Zoom calls, you really need to check them out because it will make you look professional from the get-go. Having your brand, your logo, and what you're all about behind you, hiding all your clutter, makes you look so much more professional when you put yourself out there on the internet. So check out Podcast Backdrops if you want to level up your game. My best guess so far is that it seems to be difficult because there really isn't... I, I, calling it intellectual compatibility sounds, A, a little bit insulting and B, a little bit vague to me. It's more like we don't like talking about the same things. Yeah. And I go, well, well if my, a lot of my life is science. A lot of my life is science. And so I... And this person, in many cases, just doesn't want to talk about it very much. And I don't... It's, it's kind of yeah. hard. It's kind of it's kind of like for most people, if, it's like they're children. But that's how important it is. But why do you? Oh, but you want to? Okay, so let me ask two questions. Is it that you want to share with this person your like you know what you're doing in your life? Is yeah. it to that level, or is it that you want their you know undivided attention to hey, here's like some you know stuff I'm theorizing or whatever? You want both. I mean, I guess you want yeah, both. You know, honestly, like. You want a variance of both, but right. but I'm thinking, what if somebody was a little bit more independent? They didn't really necessarily need to know a lot about your business, and you could yeah. go about being that way. But they're fulfilling you in all other areas of your life, as in, you know, they're still a great person. They love yeah. you, take care of you, and all that good stuff, and vice versa. But you're not necessarily connected on the same field, and I don't know. Yeah, maybe I could deal with that. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. It's, it's a challenge. It's one of those things where you kind of have to go. Well, what am I willing to compromise on, and what am I not? You know, and high risk, high reward. High risk, high reward. Kids, X axis is risk, Y axis is reward. That's the right. line should be linear. The line should be linear. That's right. If it's underneath, it's called an asymmetric risk reward in your favor. That's right. Yeah. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Yeah. We're going to talk about this a little bit. Oh, yeah. We're going to do this later. Bit. We're going right. to talk about, you know, what's coming up in the economy. And I think, I mean, you're screwed. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're all screwed. Yeah. This is going to be Economic Collapse the Musical. Yeah, right? <laughs> it's uh, how you can basically prepare yourself. I Buy mean, gold. Pretty much. <laughs> Stop. Wow. Hoard supplies. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Yeah, I think, I think, so to wrap up the whole algorithm piece, I think. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Do you think relationships are algorithmic in terms of how they develop? Or is it the case that these are just some magic I, I'm reluctant to, words, reluctant to use magic. Sounds supernatural, but I mean, people think of it as being unpredictable or art, not not a science type thing. I think um, the relationship part is it, it's interesting. The world we're living in today and how people we use, you know, go about approaching people. You know, people are uh, generally looking where they go for their extra activities, right? If you if you're not allowed to date people at work, which generally is the case, mm-hmm. right? Uh, then 
you go on dating apps or you go out. I think gyms are like a popular place. You're oh, going to yeah. see a lot of people. And then it's already a good place to start picking candidates possibly because you have mutual interests. So you that's already true. have that established. Or, um, But, you know, that's not to say anything. If you know, go to the restaurant, you see somebody or a bar, yeah. <clears throat> that's fine too. Um, I think the pattern is in be people's behavior once somebody's understanding of what is it that they want in life right. I think that's very important because if you've if you're not still figuring out kind of like what you want to do you know and you're not doing anything about it it's going to be tough for you to find a mate because you know you're yourself so lost so i think right. you need some level of orientation obviously nobody knows everything about where they're going or what they're doing but some level of orientation would be useful yeah otherwise and, you're just kind of drifting around yeah so yeah. if you have that uh, about yourself then i think you're more likely which you obviously yeah. are you already know a lot about yourself and still learning of course yeah, you know sure. but it's like you know enough and uh then you can kind of project okay what is it that i'm that i that uh i like so you're almost defining what is it that you find meaningful valuable in a person right now i don't know if when you're putting that input or where you're putting that input from like what you're biases are where you're gauging it from yeah. what viewpoint are you getting that you know that i want my the person to be with to have um you know this color of hair because i really love that or i don't know i never thought really that much about well, there's that. also this problem whether or not somebody can accurately self-report that sure you know somebody might say well it's important to me that they be funny and then they actually date somebody and they go well maybe that wasn't that important to me yeah, they might well, not be able to funny. query themselves funny is a accurately. subjective thing too yeah, but I you mean, the, the person can't even tell what their own thoughts are. They think they want this, but they want that. Yeah. And they don't even know it until it happens. And so I like, guess oh, what you're... What, so in that case, because people that don't know, then the algorithm mm -hmm. or something that was based on a foundation of biology, it, it supersedes your cognitive, like, Yeah, because you, you know, think you want biases. A, but you really want B. Yeah, because you're not necessarily yeah. tied to your viewpoints. You're, yeah. you're seeing, okay, this is a good foundational start. But you know, perhaps what would be more useful is if we could have a test that could give you an understanding of what kind of people you should look for. So it's actually mm -hmm. giving you a, a, because our brains are really good. If you, if you tell it what to do, mm -hmm. like specifically enough, a lot of times we don't do shit because we don't know, I know how specific to execute. Right. It's right. Like, th that's what happens with me. It's like, Oh, okay. I want to do this. Well, how? Okay. Well, and I'm not able to break it down as far as I should to right. execute on it. Yeah. But if I don't understand, then I don't do it. So, Totally lost my train. Where was I going? We are talking about the idea of whether something would be executable. We should give them a personality test. So yeah, so if you give them a go. test, then they can understand what type of, uh, you know, what to look out for at least. Yeah. You know? I think that would be very useful, and that's Good. easier yeah. to do. Probably, yeah, a lot easier, I would think. Because then, then you're kind of, you know, saying, okay, you know, like, for example, I don't know, when I was looking for a girlfriend or want somebody to date, you know, I like somebody that stays physically active above like i want a few things like i want them to have good family values you know financially was a was a thing because i was like okay i don't want somebody that's not gonna have a career of their own sure and then i want that i want to support mm -hmm. only not that you know but, but that's that's just my own thing might not be yours you right. know so and then i th i thought okay I, I don't generally care what background racially they are i didn't necessarily yeah. consider it because I, i'm attracted to a lot of different you know looking good looking girls like it's a lot of different beautiful women out there <laughs> i'm so. sure you are oh, well, why not <laughs> why not you you beautiful people everywhere that's right that's i right. live at the beach san diego what do you think yeah i mean i was a bodybuilder man i, I like girls and guys physiques i like i yeah. see a dude that's in really good shape i admire that i can see what it takes i know what it takes it's a lot of hard work yeah you know so to me it's like either way of uh, like there's a different it's almost like i think of people as a as in beauty beauty sense you know like to sure. me there's like a level of perfection that came with you know bodybuilding or people that take time to sculpt their physique it's like mm -hmm. it's like a you know beauty was a thing that peterson was alluding to last night about right hey there's this mystery behind beauty and there's also this kind of it's a little scary because you don't understand it completely well, what makes it so yeah. beautiful can we really identify what makes something beautiful to us like what is it is it that yeah. that's so perfect and it makes us feel like that's something we want to achieve, but perhaps there's also a fear that we're so imperfect ourselves and we're looking at this thing that almost feels like it could be godly because how could it be so perfect? Yeah. 
And I don't know, there was probably some form of neuro- neurological basis for that, meaning what determines why something is pretty to one person but not another. Yeah. And maybe the, our structures are similar but a little bit different. There are probably structural differences biologically. So if you could actually rewire that, I've always wondered, like, could you, I mean, could I make, I don't know, anything? Could I make a stick look beautiful to somebody if I had their neurons rewired just right so they go, oh, that is beautiful? That, I guess what, I think what you're saying is, is if, I, if I showed it to you from a different perspective, would you, would you look at it? Well, or if you, as the observer, were a different perspective, meaning you've had literally brain surgery and they've cut. Well, that a, is interesting. So I'm saying like they cut a little piece of your brain that deals with beauty. Because I've seen this before. There was one woman I saw who had open brain surgery. And they had they were poking in some part of her brain, and she thought everything was funny. She said, "Oh, you guys, because she's awake, because they're awake, because there are no pain right, because your brain, brain doesn't feel right. pain, so you can actually poke yeah, so at you're it. awake, and they use it for exploratory things. Like, what That's are you so feeling cool. now?" And she was laughing, you know, like crazy. And she said, "What? You, what's so funny?" He goes, "You doctors just standing around. It's so funny." She thought everything was funny, you know, and everything seemed to be humorous, huh. which I've heard is a reaction to some people when they have marijuana, but I don't know. Well, I wouldn't know nothing about I don't that. Know nothing right? about that. But if we did know. <laughs> It might be possible. Yeah, it could be. No, I mean, yeah, it's California. You see these people all the time, you know. And I mean, uh, there's definitely, like, marijuana is known to elevate your mood, um, mm-hmm. you know, for sure. Yeah, and so maybe it is that just like there's a region in the brain. So is alcohol in some way. But it's also, sure. alcohol has been classified as a depressant, though, so. Yeah. I, I don't think, I don't know. Well, I mean, so you said that I think, does that mean every subjective human experience is actually obtaining its qualia, meaning the sense of what it is like, rather than just being a videotape? from some part in your brain, and could you alter it? So, for example, let's say you have a memory, you remember it fondly, right? It looks like a beautiful day outside. Well, if I could mess with your brain so you thought that was funny, or I could mess with your brain so you thought the ocean was ugly, could I mess with another part of your brain and make you hate the memory instead of love so it? So mutate the, the emotion you have attached to the memory. Yeah. The by memory, just act, by the physically itself, altering yeah. your brain is what you're your saying. Brain. Yeah, if the memory is out here like a film strip, there's this, like you've talked about before, the observer and the observed. Mm, yeah. There's another part inside of you that attaches, what's that memory like? Am I happy about it? Is it in my far past? Or yeah, there's some like emotion happened? attached to that memory. Yeah, there's this sure. extra meta information, you know, metadata. You're saying, can I, can I mess with that metadata? Could you mess with the data by messing with the brain? Yeah. You, your output on yeah. the memory. So I'm all, I know that our memory itself, mm-hmm. like when we remember something old, we can change it as we're speaking it. So right. and so you're almost like you almost like are trying to read something and as you're reading it it's fuzzy. Mm-hmm. And hmm. while you're while it's coming to you, you're like adding more f- data yeah. into the the memory. Right. But but as you're adding this more data into the memory, uh when it, when you're all said and done telling your story, the next time you remember it again, mm-hmm. I believe what at least psychology says you're actually remembering the last time you told it. Yeah. I think, as I remember right, memory degrades over time and you can mutate yeah. like where it's going, you know, depending if you remember it incorrectly each yeah. time. You know, there's all kinds of compound effects. I was thinking about this earlier. Um, when I knew you years ago, did you have a beard and mustache? No, I did not. I, in my I memory, you have, do. I, in my memory, you do. I saw your picture on the wall over there and it's that, you without the beard and the mustache. Without the beard, that's what I used to look like. And in my head, you always had the beard and the mustache. Well, Even that when is I remember you, I'm going, that's not true. That's definitely not true. I thought, wait, wow. I but thought you it know was. what? Now that you say that, yeah. when I think about Brad Hughes, yeah. what clearly distinctly comes to my mind is uh, our physics classroom and the color scheme yeah. and what you used to look like then. Yeah. You were you were a little skinnier, oh, obviously. Oh, skinnier. Yeah, sure. And I, to me, it's like and a younger, skinnier, taller, younger. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That is the picture. And whenever I think about you, yeah. that is still the picture that comes, even though we've, you know, interacted many times yeah, for now. for years and years. And it's like, sure. that's still, huh. that, you're, that's weird. Trippy. Well, my ex from way, way back when, I dated her when I was like 17. We were in high school. Yeah. And then I started dating her again at 25. Yeah. And then she very quickly, like within a month or two after we started dating, quickly lost 30 pounds. And she just said it was a homeostasis. She was much happier, you know, because she'd been yeah, single before. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so, and she goes, oh, I guess I should be thankful that I didn't really, you didn't really notice in some sense because, you know, you didn't notice I was 30 pounds heavier before. And I said, you know, you look exactly the same to me now as you did when we were in high school together. Right. You know, my feelings are very strongly tied to this image of this person who I go, it's years later. You know, we're both 45 now. I can't imagine what life would be like Damn. if I saw her. Damn, that is old. Damn. How'd you even get I, here without a wheelchair? It kind of scares me, yeah. man. I'm sitting on, at the back end of 26 here. I'm about to be mm-hmm. 27 in March. Sure. I'm, I'm an older 20-year-old now. You're a wise, on the wise end of the 20s. 
Yeah. <clears throat> Closely mm-hmm. approaching that 30 and it's scaring me a little bit. Yeah. Just a little bit because, because, you know, I don't know. Like am I, I don't, I, I think a lot of people go through this. I think a lot of people my age or around my age are, you know, thinking, am I doing everything correctly? Am I doing what I should be? Like, am I set up properly? Am I, you know, cause I don't know. You're not really taught how to be a proper adult, hmm. honestly. Right. right. Like apart from your parents and they do a, they do the best they can, but how, what do you, what do your parents really know if they weren't really taught how to be a parent? That's true. You know, like they've just done their best and maybe they've done a great job and you're very fortunate, but I think there's a question of wonder in every single yeah. person about that. No, I've heard this before. Um, a friend of mine said that she, she likened it this way. There, she's a friend of mine from high school, right? And yeah. she and her brother have gone radically divergent paths. She has four or five children, you know, just, and they're, you know, this is, you know, a lot of her time is spent raising her children and raising right. them well. And the oldest one, I think, is a teenager now. Her brother was loved playing the saxophone in high school and started playing, I don't know where, but eventually now, last I heard, he had been on tour with the Red Hot Chili Peppers as their oh. opening act. Oh. And so his lifestyle was literally like you hear in a movie, like he can go to like, you know, there's concerts traveling all around the world and right. parties, you know, and hers is sitting in Ohio, you know, and enjoying her life, you know. And, and she expressed to me once that she said, yeah, I feel like, you know, I wonder if I'm doing it wrong. And then, you know, her brother kind of mentions, yeah, look, we're all just doing it the way we want to do it. Right. And it kind of made me think I was going, if it, I'm, I'm paraphrasing him pretty badly, but the idea that there isn't a right or a wrong answer to it. You know, it's what's best for you. Wow. You know? Yeah. And I always figure if I'm happy more than, if I ask myself how happy am I, if I'm an eight or above out of 10 most of the time, okay. Because, you know, I've heard Tony Robbins say the problem with problems is that you think you shouldn't have any. Exactly. Yeah. Everybody thinks they shouldn't have any something. problems. There's always a gap between where you yeah. are and where you're going. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if this is, that's a good segue into like talking about how people could potentially prepare for what's coming because honestly, a concern that I've heard people, other people voice to the younger generation, the older, wiser folks is that we've never really seen a massive economic downturn apart from 2008. Most of us, we haven't necessarily seen things go terribly, terribly bad, right? like the 2000 or Mm -hmm. like before that or you know the 80s the 80s the, uh, i wasn't even born right so like mid 90s <laughs> yeah so we don't know anything yeah. honestly we don't know what it's like right now we've, we're, we've all we've seen in our entire childhood has been a massive shift in technology technological boom basically sure. every all the money dollars everything's going there you know i have a career out of that and mm-hmm. it's like that's that's where everything's going so that's we've yeah. only seen growth honestly right. 2008 was a was a hiccup you know, but on, we, I don't know, like I, I know my personal family was definitely affected by it, but, sure. but like in the grand scheme of things, that was not even that bad. Well, I think it's, uh, my impression is that the drop in the S&P was comparable, not as much as, but uh, like it's the only second to the depression. Yeah. And so the point is that if you... But the recovery wasn't... Yeah, the recovery wasn't as like, bad. It was like 30 days later, they 90 days later, it was yeah. like, okay, we're, we're like going... Yeah, we're starting to go the other way, yeah, right. So... And then, of course, they call it a beautiful deleveraging if the credit markets restore themselves in, in a way that's optimized. Um, beautiful who, deleveraging. Yeah, anybody who really wants to know this should watch Ray Dalio's uh, How the Economy Works. You, ah, you can YouTube Yeah, Ray it. Dalio has, has some good... It's a 30-minute video, and it is... Yeah. I got it. For the longest time, I couldn't understand. Because I would look at economics, and i go, yeah. why is it that if I give Abhinav a dollar and he yeah. gives a dollar to, say, his landlord... Oh, there's only so many dollars. How can we possibly have booms and busts if there's only so many dollars to be had? And I found out by watching his work that that's just not true. We create debits all the time. Every time I use a credit card, I've literally magically made a debit where there is no dollar there yeah. to, tied to it. I've said, I will. Oh, I owe you. Yeah, right? it's an IOU, right? Yeah. And if you add up the amount of how much outstanding debts there are compared to the actual amount of dollars, I thought he said it was like nine to one or something. It might even be worse. The, the debt That's how much up. we've like... We are exceeding Spend the number of without dollars. having. Yeah, so like, let's say there. Let's just make up a number. So, Ameri- so the the yeah. global economy is just a teenager that doesn't know how to control money. Quite apt, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so eventually, he said, eventually you pretty much have to pay the bill. Some people will start losing their jobs, and the system starts to fall down like yeah. a, series, a series of dominoes. And so this is why we've always had booms and busts as long as we've had the type of modern economics where we've credit markets. Oh. You know, without credit markets, you wouldn't have the people incurring the debits. Well, we keep raising our um, debt ceiling. Mm-hmm. Is, that, is that the correct terminology? Yes, that's right. Okay, so what that basically means, I, from my understanding, is that we're essentially saying, so we have X amount of debt. Mm-hmm. Um, we obviously can't pay it off. Right. 
why don't we just increase how much we have so so we can keep spending? Do you mean we're gonna in, have to pay it off anyway? Increase the amount of debt we have. The debt ceiling, sure. so how much more we can keep yeah. spending without having to pay it back, right? Right. So, so how, why do we do that, and how can we keep doing that? The problem is that if you borrow money at a low interest rate, it's like econo- it's like economic gasoline on the engine. You can use the you know money that you've borrowed to do something with, okay. right? So we will incur debts to other countries all the time, and they incur debts to us. You know, each of us owes each other money. Um, and so you hope that if you keep stimulating the economy with this in the right way and in the appropriate amount, the economy will be healthy. Right. Um, if you have an idea to go start a business and you have no money, it could take you a long time to build up to that point. If you have the idea to start a business and someone says, I'll give you a nice low interest loan so you can get started, yeah. then I can stimulate growth in a way I couldn't before. Um, my impression is, although I've never checked this, the problem is not the actual amount of debt you have. It should be debt compared to your GDP. Meaning a tiny country might not produce very much, so they shouldn't have as much debt. Right. And so you can see how over leveraged they are, meaning how much if they've taken out too much money and they can't ever pay you back. You know, it's kind of like one of those, you know, really high risk loans. So what happens to, to those countries? So far as I know, they get restructured the debt. I don't know if, I mean, I think the country, if it had to, would say it defaults. Like, is that what that happened to Gr- Greece? The Greeks Greek. were defaulting on, yeah, some of their debts, I think, to the European Union. I think they were supposed to pay a certain amount of money into the European Union and did not. Um, and that created, I guess they called it the Greek Eurozone crisis. Gotcha. And there was a question of, well, if somebody doesn't pay back their debts. Now, of course, we're talking at a super macro level, a lot of which I don't know a lot about right. yet. But we're talking at this really high level of like, this is the whole world's economy. But the same thing is repeated on smaller scales all the time. You know, states borrow from other states. Cities issue municipal bonds. Mm-hmm. And then at the local level, you have something like, you know, banks that will give you a certain amount of money. And then you can put it in stocks or houses or whatever. And so all this is the same cycle of people borrowing and paying back, taking a bigger and bigger levels over the course of, according to Ray, about eight years. So what? It was eight to thirteen. So years. now tell me, what is it that you think um, is is happening, based mm-hmm. on, and, and and you know, to anybody listening, anything we're talking about, we're not uh, we're not advising you to do anything with your money. We're simply just having a conversation. Yeah, we're, we're not, neither of us are pros. Yeah, we're not licensed. Neither of us is a licensed like anything. financial advisor. <laughs> yeah. Definitely I'm telling not you what me. I think for me and you do what you want. Yeah, for do you. what you want. Make your assessment. <laughs> like Tony Robbins said, I'm not your guru. Do what you want. Yeah, do what you want to do. <laughs> All right. So what do you think is, is, is going on? Like let's have, have yeah. a little bit more about Okay. About so we know the th- the cycle goes up for a certain amount of time. And then at some certain point you can't borrow any more money. Meaning the company goes, Hey, you're already, you're not bringing in enough to pay back your current debts. Some of the companies will then start to go into default, which causes the market to go downward. People, companies go into default, they lay off the workers. The workers get laid off, they won't buy more stuff. Sure. Now, of course, now we're starting on like a roller coaster, it's reinforcing itself going down because now they won't buy more stuff at other places. The other places also can't pay their debts. And now they go out of business. And it's like this chain reaction. And so that's normal. This happens all the time. Ray points out in the video that these are boom and bust cycles. We've always, I could never figure out when I was younger how it is, because I remember being in the recession in the 90s um, and in the early 2000s and going, how in the world is it? Like we still have a certain number of dollars in the world. I said, now I know that's not true. It's the actual debts with interest on them that are being messed up. Yeah, they're created as he puts it out of thin air. Yeah, it's brilliant. He's so brilliant. Um, he's really one of the richest understand. men in the world, right? Oh yeah, he started Bridgewater Associates. Eighteen point eighteen point six billion dollars. Oh, yeah, one of the richest guys in the entire planet. And all, and he's a financial guy that, yep. through and through. He started his uh, hedge fund literally out of his two bedroom apartment with That's no money. Amazing, incredible. Yeah, and he's he's really good when he talks. I really go. He's got a lot to How say. How do you counter him with somebody like a Warren Buffett? Well, or are they? I mean, they're parallel. Yeah, um, Buffett is more of a buy and hold long term investor. He's looking right. for companies that he thinks will go up or down based upon people. Well, they've perception, over, yeah, people long-term. perception and long term things like fundamental indicators. Like, do they just not have? Do they have too many competitors? Are they not able to bring in enough revenue because of some licensing issue or whatever? Sure. You know, uh, Dalio as a hedge fund manager is trying to go for short term grabs. Like he'll look for shorter term profits. Okay. But in order to do this, he says you have to be. Going against what everybody else thinks is going to happen, and you have to be right more than you're wrong. I mean, he goes, if everybody else is watching the stock market go down, you're waiting until there's blood in the streets, then you buy, because that's when it's going to start going back up again. You have to run contrary to what other people are thinking and be right. So, it's, I mean, ethically, it's kind of <laughs> silly because it's like certain, it's like the have versus the have nots, right? Sure. People are always trying to, you know, yeah. we're almost like gaming other human beings. Yeah. Uh, the the lesser, 
sort of people oh. that are more frivolous and maybe not necessarily of higher conscientiousness and understanding their behavior patterns and just being fools to mass marketing. Right. Um, and you said there and go, you're like, is that fair? I don't know what else to do I don't about. know. I've thought about economic systems so for a while. So what do you do? Do you suffer too? Like, I mean, yeah. you know. So do I join them? Yeah, yeah do exactly. I join them? Should I, should I suffer? <laughs> and then you also think about, well, should I help these people by giving them money? Is yeah. that the way to do it? I and don't think so. And then I was like, I make the same decision they just made and they're yeah. like, who's that money? Sure. Well, so, I mean, I it's think. a complex question. It's a very complex question. Not a, not a straightforward answer. But with that said, though. With uh, that said, for what I'm doing. Yeah. The economy is about to go into a recession. Pretty and, and that seems pretty pretty much yeah, the like common thread so everybody is saying. But it's yeah. almost an, uh, the, the, the question is really when yeah. and what can you do now? And how can you prepare yourself at this moment to be, you know, in an anticipated, you know, you're anticipating. Sure. Obviously, Make sure you're ready. But you're ready right. to pull the trigger when yeah. needed. Well, step one is to look at what's called the divergence between the 10 year and three month treasury note. Um, you want to pull it up the screen? Let, yeah. let's, let's Google Just this Just Google uh, Fred. Fred. 10 year. 10 year. Minus. Three month. Okay, let's see what this is. Yeah, there it is. So Fred, the St. Louis... The, okay, Fred is a... Um, so we're at a website they're the here. Division, yeah, there's, there's the uh, Federal Reserve Bank. Okay, the this thing is... they robbed in Die Hard 3. Oh, oh, that's what it <laughs> yeah, is. The Federal ah, Reserve. Love that movie. Originally, they held gold, but now they also yeah, set, help You know what's policy. funny about that? You what's told that? me this uh, in our physics class about oh, yeah. that movie. You were like, you know how those guys are robbing those gold bars? Yeah. It's completely unrealistic. Those things yeah. are heavy. Yeah, you take you the density of gold. You can't, can't, just, just, no uh, you can't just toss around yeah. gold bars. Funny, that looks like a styrofoam bar with yeah. gold paint. <laughs> right? <laughs> how is that happening? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so tell me about Fred. Oh, so the idea of Fred is then tracks the difference, the maturity time, maturity, the 10 year minus three month, how, what the rate is that they are paying for that on the open market. So for example, if they're equal, if a 10 year treasury note is going for, I don't know, make up a number, 3%. If a 10-year treasury note, can we define what that means? Meaning it's a, a bond issued by the United States Treasury that says over the, in 10 years you'll have X amount of dollars. Okay. And so they buy and sell these on the open market just like stocks. It's on the bond market. Gotcha. And so their qu- publicly quoted rate, they'll say the 10-year treasury is at, make up a number, 3%, right? And so the three-month treasury is in three months the federal government will pay you this much. It's a shorter-term thing if you want to tie up money for a couple of months. Mm. And so then... That is some other number. Now, normally, people will pay more for the 10-year security in this case than they are for the three-month. What that means is this number will be positive. You can see on the screen where it's percent. It's the difference, one minus the other. So if they're both getting 3%, zero. then it's zero because three months, the 3% minus 3% is zero. Sure. Now, what this calls is an aversion. Whenever this number crosses beneath zero is right when you here. should be watching. Yeah, well, zero is down there on the very bottom, the little black line. Yeah, when that so blue you're line, saying whenever, um, let me zoom in here, yeah. whenever here it goes below, so this is the zero line, I believe. That's right. In the chart here, mm-hmm. zero, zero. So whenever it goes below this is indica- indicative of? That we're going to have a recession within a year. Damn. Now, I can show you data on my spreadsheet. I, I yeah, imagine. can we look? Yeah, so let's here, look at let, that. Me, let me pull So that. what you're watching for is the date that divergence hits zero. That's what they call it. Okay. Boom. Okay. So I took every recession okay. uh, from since World War II, and you can see them listed there in column A. Right. And then I looked at what month, the 10-year minus the three-month at zero, meaning the signal we're looking for. When did it happen? Sorry, say that again. Sure. The 10-year minus the three-month. So this is the second column? Yeah. And so I said, what date did that happen? What month and year? Because I want to be able to look at the recession. I want to see when did it hit zero in the bond divergence. And then when did the actual recession start? And so I'm looking at how they are, how far apart they are in each of these. And so you can see the recession, column C now yeah. is the recession start date minus the bond divergence date. Meaning how far apart did you get the signal from the recession? Okay. okay. How far did you get it? Get the? So the, the signal that you're going to have a recession until you were actually the recession started. Okay, so based on the graph that we mm-hmm. saw, how far from then, from then until the recession, till the starts. actual recession happens? What was the time frame based on the last so, however many years you, you based did on every recession taken since World War II? Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, the difference between them is normally nine months, and the standard deviation is four point four months. 
Now, it's hard to tell if this follows what we call Gaussian statistics because there's only a few days. You're going to have to explain that to me and my audience in a way that oh. makes sense because none of us um, are mathematicians here. Okay. Um, you've got the number for the average of something. It gives you some information. However, it doesn't tell you about how likely it is that you are on the average value. For example, let's say we're taking the heights of average people in a room of just adults, okay. adult men. So they might say the average height is five foot ten. Okay. And so they've sampled a bunch of just men sitting in a room someplace, right? Now let's say instead I pulled a sample and I said, what's the average height of a group of people that are made up of toddlers and the NBA bas- basketball teams? When I do so, I still might get an average of five foot ten. But none of the people are near five foot ten. The toddlers are really tiny, and the basketball players are really huge. Gotcha. And so that would be a st- bigger standard deviation, meaning the spread of how far the data is from the average. Got gotcha. something with a standard deviation of zero means every value is right on the average. Guy A was five ten. Guy B was five ten. Guy C was five ten, and they averaged them. Gotcha. And the average is five ten. That's a standard deviation of zero. And then so as you start getting people that are further and further out, it pulls the distribution outward. So the standard deviation is bigger. It means that if you randomly pick one, you won't be necessarily likely to be as close to the average. Okay. Right. So let's say, for example, we did the situation with the toddlers and the basketball team. Right. If I picked one of the people out of the group, the average was 5'10". Is anybody in that group going to be 5'10"? Not necessarily. No, because I got toddlers that are like two feet tall and I got NBA players that are like eight feet tall or something. And so even though they have the same average of 5'10", because the standard deviation is so huge, you're not likely to get on that value yourself. Now, I'm using an extreme example with toddlers and NBA, but the point is how far apart the pieces are from the average. So generally, a standard deviation graph Mm -hmm. looks like a bell curve. In some cases. In some cases. Yeah, if if there's certain rules that are applied called Gaussian tests. Okay. Yeah, but for the moment, let's just assume it is because it's reasonable. You know, it's not unreasonable, I think, to say so. So if that's the case, then the average difference from when the recession started to when the bond divergence date was nine months and the standard deviation of it was about four and a half months. That means most of the time you will get a recession starting between nine minus four and a half, which is four and a half, four and, a half yeah. and nine plus four and a half, which is 13 and a half. So you should so between between four and a half and 13 and a half months from the moment that the bond diversion hit zero, hit zero. You're going to be getting a recession. And it's headed that way. And it's headed that way. You you saw in the graph how much it's been going down. I thought it was going to hit it a week and a half ago. So what dictates it going back up? Um, Normally when the economy starts to get healthier, when people are willing to pay more for those securities again, you'll see the spread start to occur again and it'll go back up. Okay. So just a recap Mm -hmm. on what we're seeing here. Based on all the recessions that have happened. Since World War II. Since World War II. Yeah. What we're seeing is... Um, from the time the graph that we saw called Fred, yep, right, the which, divergence graph, the divergence graph, <clears throat> which represents which represents the difference in interest rates offered on a ten-year treasury and a three-month treasury. Okay, so that graph is dipping. We're seeing, yeah, and, and it's and about when to it crosses hit zero, zero. It's a problem. When it hits zero, it's a problem, but it's also an opportunity yeah. for people to. Invest. Invest. Now, we better look a little bit over, just a little bit more, a few columns over. Okay. Uh, oh, and also, hold yeah. on. To invest, why? Because what, based on the research uh, that you did um, on all the different crashes, mm-hmm. you've discovered that the time from the when the graph actually hits zero to when the recession actually happens mm-hmm. seems to be anywhere from... Uh, was four, it four and a half four and to half thirteen and a half months to mm-hmm. thirteen and a half months, yeah. and that's when the market for sure will go down. Yeah, but we can get a little bit better information okay. over the other side because I can do yeah, more. Yeah, let's than that. do it. Let's go. Let's go better than that. Let's say I'm talking about the length right here in years column F. It means I can tell you how long the recession lasts before it hits its bottom and starts to bounce back up again, so you know how far out to watch. Now this is in years, so the average length of the recession is 0.96, which means it's about a year long. On average, standard deviation is 0.367 years, which is what about a little over three, three months. months. So, yeah. so sorry, this column yeah. is representing. Tell me again, what? How long the recession lasts? Okay, so what now? So now to continue on, once it's once we've hit the recession, that could be four months, four and a half yeah. months to thirteen months from yeah, from the from moment the, the graph hits zero. That's right. When it hits zero, let's say we're in the recession five six months from now. Sure. 
Okay. Now, how long is it going to last? How long will it last? And that on average, it should last a year plus or minus three months. And and that's the entropy, right? The plus or minus. The standard deviation. Standard deviation is that. Which means it'll probably last between nine and a year, nine months and a year and three months. Wow. Right, and then so the next column well, we're starting in wow. G. Uh, what, hold the hold the phone, Bradley. Whatley. <laughs> yes, Avana. Seriously, you're telling me. I'm a little I'm a little little surprised. That's kind of that? cool. What's up? Um well guys, I didn't expect it. I didn't actually expect there to be such a striking correlation. Um Well, let's be clear. All I'm telling you is what past data yields. I know, I didn't expect it to and be I'm a pattern. I'm hoping it predicts the future. Yeah, well, that's right. I didn't right. Ex- yeah. So uh, we don't know. We don't we actually yeah. honestly don't know. You really don't this know. This is like a theory that we're testing out. Exactly. Let's see. It's an experiment. Mm-hmm. Right, we're not trying. To, we're not. By the way, disclaimer: we're not telling you to put your money in anything. Yeah, or not to put your money in anything. Yeah, do what, what you, you want. Do what your money is your business. Yeah, do what you want. I'm telling you what I'm doing, and that's all okay. I'm telling you. All right, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. So if you look at column I, you can actually see the percent that the S and P 500 fell from the start to the finish. From the start of the recession to mm-hmm. the finish, finish of the recession, yeah. how much did the S and P 500 fall for the last hundred years but, of yeah, crashes? For the last, well, only since World War II, so about since seventy years. Okay, seven years. But so I want to be really clear here. Yes. I was a little bit disconcerted because when I started looking deeper into the data, a recession is defined as the third quarter of consecutive decline in growth. Third quarter of of decline in growth, meaning suddenly we're selling less widgets or whatever for our GDP. And so as the GD, as GDP drops on the third quarter, they go, Hey, that's economic contraction for three consecutive quarters. That means that you're in a recession. Mm. Now, my concern is then, though, that doesn't tell you where the stock market was before the recession started. It's like watching a mountaintop, and the top of it is the S&P 500 at its highest point, right? That's where you want it, because you'd love to make your action right there, and then watch it go down. The problem is that high occurred before the start of the recession, right? meaning I knew it was between the divergent state of zero and the start of the recession, but I don't know when. So I made another chart a little further over that's all okay, highlighted. let's go over here. There you go. And so that is the high date before the recession, meaning that recession was starting in 1960. When was the highest point the stock market hit right before the recession hit? Okay, so how many months before? Um, or that how is many? the actual date. And then there's okay. between, uh, let me think about this for just a second. You can move the mic back, by the way, to get closer to the screen. Oh, yeah. So Here. whatever's comfortable for you. Oh, there you Okay, that's fine. So this is, make sure I got this right. This should be the time between the high and the start of the recession in months. Okay, so four, four, five, seven and a half. Okay, and what's the what's the analysis of um, that data in totality? Okay, so if you look at everything inside the thick black line, yeah, it's saying that the time between when the stock market hit its highest point and when it hits lowest point was ten months. So it's about the same as a year, but not quite. We can remember that one was like I don't know thirteen months or so. So effectively saying within ten months, mm-hmm. it's gonna go back to a healthier state yeah it, it, well in the worst worst case it's 10 months plus six six and a half right so it could be yeah a year that's and a half. the idea yeah. worst case and so best but case I'm, I'm looking at the average i'm trying to remember my average values here oh, oh sorry. average between the high and low was 10 months yeah no you're right that's right and uh, yeah exactly between whenever you're at the high of the stock market versus when you go hey i've hit the bottom things are going to start getting better okay and so the average time was about 11 months plus or minus six and a half so anywhere from, what, five months to 17. So Bradley, if tomorrow the economy starts doing better, mm-hmm. this data doesn't make it as sure much no. sense. It's fine. It'll start doing better because we haven't hit the high point yet. We haven't hit the divergence. You got to hit the so divergence before you hit the high point. Yeah, we're just waiting for this to happen. Mm-hmm. I'm very curious to see if it comes out. Yeah. So how can we speculate when... Okay, great. Makes sense. How can we now speculate... Um, what's a good time to invest? Like, okay. should, should people daily be going on to that website? Ah. You know, what is it What is it that somebody should be doing at this point? Well, they should be watching Fred, okay, which so you just, read the link. You know, let's go, go here. We're going to switch back to Fred here. Yeah, so you can see that when it hits the black line, your divergence is zero. Right. Right. Totally. And then, by the way, there's a paper just a little bit down if people want it on how well this predicts the market. It does a really good job. Okay, so if somebody wants to read that. So yeah. to the to the anybody watching, this is Fred dot St. Louis Fred dot org. You can just Google um Fred Economic Research. You'll probably yeah. find it. 
That's good. Yeah. And then so go back to the spreadsheet. Okay, hold on here. I gotta switch the. I gotta remember which column I need to look at here. Okay. Uh, could you go to the left? Yes, sir. You hear that airplane? Oh yeah. <laughs> Wonder if the mics pick it up. Most likely. Probably. Yeah. Okay, so scroll over a little bit to the right. Okay, stop right there. And so you can see the, where the recession starts. Sure. Go a little bit more. Go a bit more. Let's see what this. Okay, I'm just trying to remember because I can map out how long. Oh, if you I'm need sorry. to write anything down, you can. Go all the way left. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and so there you can see the recession start date. I'm looking for what I'm trying to think of was I was trying to remember if I had any data on that that was the difference between when the stock market hit its highest and when the divergence date was. If I knew that, I could go, okay, when you see the divergence at zero, go wait seven months, and then that's the highest point. Now's the time to sell everything Start off. Start taking your money out. Yeah. But I was trying to see. I know it's on there. I had it before. I might need to look at this a little bit more. Well, that's fine. Not a problem. Yeah. So, okay. So let's say, I mean, okay, the facts are pretty clear. So if the yeah. market hits, or the, the graph hits zero, uh-huh. Uh, roughly what we have seen as a pattern mm -hmm. between four and a half to 13 months, months from that point, there will be a recession in the economy. And we're very close to hitting that zero. Yeah, we're close. Okay. We're at, at 0.15 about a week and a yeah. half or two weeks ago. Great. Um, and this is, this is cyclical. This is definitely mm -hmm. something that happens in the economy. So it's nothing to freak out sure. about it, but it's something you can use to take advantage of sure. by saving some of your money now and having mm -hmm. it ready to invest when the market is at its lowest. So then potentially you can ride the wave because it's going to correct itself. Always does. Absolutely does. Unless you're saying that America is going to completely fail mm. uh, and the whole world's economy is going to completely fail. Maybe it will, yeah. but you know. If it does, you got bigger problems. Yeah, you got bigger problems you don't than, care about than your about stock your stock market. market. So you might be worried about, you know, having a safe place to live. Yeah. So fair enough. Okay, so people should at this point potentially have their um, you know money saved and mm -hmm. ready in an investment account. Mm -hmm. What kind of things should people be looking into? Do you Depends think? on how much risk you're willing to take. Okay, so this is now yeah. talking about high risk, uh, high risk. Well, let's go no? low risk first. Okay. Because there's a couple but, of easy but, but ones. That's, so okay, so we're going to talk about... going down. Sure. Yeah. Two things you should look at are either SDN, which is an inverse fund. Can I get rid SD? of this now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. It's either SD or SDN. If you look at like stock market ticker SD, I think it is. Okay, let me let me get out of the browser here right quick. Cool. Okay, hey, uh, could you go to finance.yahoo.com? And then try like just SD, I think. All right, hold on here. Okay, just search for the ticker. Yeah. SD. No, that's not it. Try SD. Oh, SDS. There it is. Yeah. And so what this is, this is an inverse fund. It means when the S&P 500 goes down, it goes up. Uh, and so you're going, well, if I'm betting the stock market's going to go down, I could go buy some of this stuff. Because this is going to go up, it's the it inverse. Up. It's an inverse fund. Now, it has an inverse beta of what's called a beta of negative two almost, negative 1.94. Right. Which means it moves at twice the amount of the S&P 500. If the S&P 500 goes down by one, that thing goes up by two. And so it's an easy way to grab money if you're going, I'm pretty confident that a year from now, the S&P is going to be lower. You're right. Buy some shares of this. <laughs> Help yourself. So what? So let me ask you a question. Yeah. Is it a bad, even though the economy hasn't hit the lowest? So technically, this is, this is right now lower, mm -hmm. right, than That's it right. should be. So it isn't it a good time to buy this right now? Sure. If you think the market, depends on how long you're going to hold it for. And if you think that the market's going to go down very soon, then buy some of this because it's going to go up. Cool. Awesome. What else? Uh, you could also buy what's called PSQ. Should I look up that? Sure. PSQ. Mm -hmm. Pro shares short QQQ. And the triple Q is your tech stocks. Is a tech stock. Yeah, it's a tech stock basket. So PSQ goes the other way. So if you're saying, hey, all these tech stocks have been making so much money, they're going to go down over the next couple of years in the recession. Hold on. Pause. Buy some PSQ. Question here. Yeah. You're telling me that there's people that are just sitting around saying, yo, this shit is not going to work. And we're going to invest on the contrary. So it's like they're playing both sides of the game. Sure. Right? Yeah. And that's fair. Sure. Because every, pay, every person that, that thinks, because everybody that thinks the market's going to go up, somebody has to think it's going to go down. Okay. Right? So Why it's would a skeptic's agree? game. Yeah, yeah, it's a skeptic's game. Yeah. I think things are going to go down, so I'm going to go buy some now. And so this gives me an easy way to get on the action in one of the ways. Mm. And so PSQ is the opposite. It's an inverse fund. 
for the uh, triple queue, which is tech stock stuff. And so you know, this is another easy way if you want. To, and when I say lower risk, I mean this is lower than what I'm about to discuss after. So this. lower risk, and now now this is something that these are individual stocks. Uh, they're actually an account. What's called an ETF, an exchange an ETF. traded fund. ETF. Okay. Yeah, the fund goes out and buys stuff that would make it so that it performs. Who, who uh, owns the fund? Depends on which brokerage house. So you'll hear like Vanguard so who, funds who, or something. Who would be managing pro shares, or like who uh, would who would a, decide what shares are in there? Uh, the there'll probably be an asset manager that works for the brokerage. So, so a Vanguard's brokerage one. puts out a share or an ETF. Well, some of these banks are so big, you know, you could have funds and you could also have other services. Um, I think I can't remember who pout pro shares. It wasn't Vanguard. I don't know who it is. Okay. Like Vanguard is a giant bank. Yeah, sure. I have Vanguard. Yeah, and, and all they're doing is saying, okay, we're going to put together a basket of assets that when the S and P goes down, this thing goes up. Okay. And so that way, if you want to bet on the market going down, because you're going, these people aren't being reasonable anymore, go ahead and buy some of that. Interesting. So this is now, considering now we talked about a graph a little <clears> bit earlier, <throat> where it was uh, uh, risk on the y-axis. No, risk on the x-axis. Risk on the x-axis and reward, reward. on the y-axis. And mm-hmm. essentially, you would draw a line through mm-hmm. saying that you know, the higher your risk um, the higher your reward. Yeah, that would make sense. Right. right, that would make sense. Right, and if that's not true, then it's a an, an asymmetric asymmetrical risk reward. right risk reward situation, which, which is what you want. Which is what you want because it's in your favor. Yeah, if it's asymmetric, meaning you only risk say a dollar, right. but every time you win, you win two dollars. Okay. Well, sure. If I'm paying a game that's a fifty fifty game, right? Then overall, if every time I lose, I lose a dollar, and every time I win, I win two dollars. In the long run, that's easy to see. I'm ahead. Mm-hmm. And so the risk was one dollar. The game was two dollars. Now, of course, the problem is you also have to weigh in what the probability is of each outcome. You know, with something like a coin flip, it's obviously fifty-fifty. With something like rolling a die, it's one out of six. Yeah. Right? But with real life, it gets a lot trickier. What's the probability the United States will default on their assets? What's the probability this country will do that? What's the probability our political system will do this? And all these things are generating probabilities that you have to subjectively assess. Is that. Is that data that is only privy to the financial firms? Well, I don't think anybody even knows how to calculate it, even in principle. Mm. I don't think I've ever seen a way that you could, because there's too many variables in the world. You know, yeah, who is actually sitting around doing this? Yeah, and maybe how could a, you? A, well, yeah, I don't know. You're right. Yeah, know. There's all kinds of data that's still being left out of the model. And so therefore, you won't capture very much of the variance. Mm. Yeah, but so the idea is then you can go buy these. If you want to go a little riskier, meaning you want So go, somebody yeah. would buy this. Sure. And then... They would it. monitor the um, Fred graph. Well, they should buy this after Fred crosses. Right. So let's say Fred is at zero and you've, yeah. you've ended up buying pro shares. And then what was the last one we just talked about? Um, uh, SDS. SDS. So you bought pro shares and SDS. And now you're, what should you be doing to monitor? Waiting to see. And of course, this thing said from the high of the S&P to the low was, I think it was like right. nine months. Right. That means you should be holding this for about nine months, and you're probably going to be at the point where now you're at the highest. Because while the stock market was going down, you were going up. Okay. And so at the end of that nine months, you go, okay, it might be time to sell out. Time, okay. And the longer you wait, the bigger chance you're taking. Right. Because I mean, as soon as the other market yeah. starts going up, you go you're down. going down. Exactly. So you, you got to kind of time that too. Mm-hmm. So I guess as it's, it's, um, it's you looking out for when to time that, what <clears throat> are some tools or resources somebody could potentially look into? Well, obviously, the spreadsheet, I think, said nine months on average. But if you want to go... In I know, but like, that, let's say nine months, that's, that's yeah. the average. But how, is there some real-time metric think, that we can um, track? or we can... The unemployment rate comes out, <clears throat> I remember, once a month, I believe. I can't remember how often. Where does it come out? Just anywhere? Like um, it's the office of... I don't know why oh, you I know remember. that. It's a, I used to know this, too. I don't know why I knew it. Um, that's a good question. But you get things like unemployment rate, consumer spending. Yeah. This will give you some ideas to how far something goes down before it starts coming back up again. Right. And so once it does, you go, okay, wait your nine months, sell it back out. Get out of there. Um, and that would be way number one to make some money. Way number two has more risk, but also a lot more reward. Which is? Which is to sell stock or to purchase put options on the stock market. All right, let's take a second. Let's look up what the heck put options are. Sure. Because I don't know and I want to learn. Okay, a put option in finance, a put or put option is a stock market device which which gives the owner the right but not the obligation to sell an asset at a specified price by a predetermined date to any given party the purchase of a put option is interpreted as a negative sentiment 
about the future value of the underlying stock. So you're saying it's going to go down, I That's think. Right. <clears throat> That's right. Is there something that is the opposite of that? Sure. It's called a call option. Ah. Gives you the right to buy it at a price. And so when it goes up, let's say the stock is trading at 100. Okay. And you buy a call option with a, what's called a strike of 100. It means if the stock stays at 100, you don't do anything. But if it goes up to, say, $101, you go, oh, good. Now I can buy this stock for $100 and sell it off on the stock market for, for $101. Make a dollar. Make a dollar. Okay. And so you buy a call option when you're bullish, meaning you think the stock market is going to keep going way up. Because if you think it's going to go up to, I don't know, 120 by the end of your expiration of your option, right. you buy the option for a dollar, and then you pull out your, you, know, you get your option. It has a strike of 100, and at expiration, the stock is at 120. Now you get to go ahead and buy the stock for 100 and sell it off at 120. So you made $20 minus the $1 you pay for the option is 19. So in a sense, you risk $1 because you couldn't lose more than your option premium. The most they can take away from you is what you pay for the option. Because you don't have to. You have the right to buy it, but not the obligation to do so. Whoa. So you're risking a dollar, but if you think it's going to go up to 120 you could gain $19. But you only lose a dollar. You only lose a dollar because that's all they can take. And if you're, if you're expecting the right moves, you can set up an asymmetric risk-reward ratio. Because you can't risk more than what you pay for the option. They can't take any more so than that. the gain is way higher. Yeah, <clears throat> if, if you do it right. So that's essentially now hacking the linear graph that we described earlier of, yeah. you know, having a linear risk to reward ratio. Yeah. Now, there are probably some people, I got to think about this. It depends upon where you think the thing's going to go is determines your risk reward because you could lose all of your and money. What determines where you think things are going to go? This is where this, this is, is a perception of probability problem. Is the problem. Right? Exactly. If you're really confident, let's say time traveling, you showed up from a week from now and said it's going to be a 120, then of course it's better. But now you're going to have insider knowledge. That's not the same thing. Ooh. Yeah, but so if you do this, if you buy some put options, you buy them further down than what the S&P is currently trading at. So, for example, the S&P is, I think, like 260-something. Like okay. That was 266. So let's say I want to buy one. I think the stock market is going to go down 20%. So I buy an, an S&P put option with a strike 20% down. So that would be 52 away. <clears throat> so let's say I'm saying the market's at 266 Two hundred sixty-six dollars. Uh, yeah, I think the SPY fund is currently two sixty-six something. Okay, yeah. Let's take a concrete example. Yeah. So well, let's uh, say it's at two fifty. Make math yeah. easier. That's good. Let's do it. So go ahead. So I buy an option that says, "Hey, I'm allowed to sell that to somebody for two hundred dollars." That's the because strike. you think it's going to go down by fifty bucks. I think it'll go down fifty bucks or more. Okay, so you say I'm going to uh, sell a put option, or what's I'm going to buy a put option. I'm going to buy a put option, saying. That I will buy the S and P five hundred at two hundred. Uh, wait, I got to think about this right. Is that correct? It gives me the right to. Okay, let's see what it says again. Let me make sure this okay. correctly. I always get screwed no, up. No, no worries, no worries. That's what we're here for. Yeah. All right. Um, gives the owner the right to sell it to you at two hundred dollars. There it is. Okay, great. Yeah, that's right. It gives me the right. For example, if I buy the put option, I have the right to sell it to you at two hundred dollars. Now it's currently at two fifty, as you said. So it's useless because, well, why would I want to sell it to you at $200 when you can turn around and sell it for $250 50, on yeah, the open market? you'll get 50 bucks, yeah. and I'm not getting shit. So that means the put option only has value when the price of the stock goes underneath the strike. Now let's say it's dropped way down to 150 It's, one, it's like, yeah, 150 or something. Well, I get the right to sell it to you for 200 no matter what, which means I can buy it at 150 sell it to you for 200 because I bought that put option, and now I've made my 50 bucks. So who would be a candidate that would buy it at 200 though, if it's at 150 They don't have a choice because they sold you that put option through a security, oh. through a brokerage. They have to buy it at 200 That's why they sold you the option. They got a dollar for their trouble for hoping it doesn't hit 200 So you're telling me there's companies that are putting out these options. Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually mostly the Chicago Board of Options Exchange in Chicago. Are these guys stupid or something? Mm-mm. People write options. The brokers write options on all kinds of prices because you don't know for sure if the market's going to drop to two hundred. If it doesn't drop to two hundred, you I, I lost my but dollar. They're speculating paid. too. Everybody's speculating. That's all it is. Oh, <sighs> that's why I don't want to. That's why I never like was attracted mm -hmm. to this game because it's so hard to understand. Yeah, you literally are going. Okay, I think the market's going to do this or that. That's all you're doing. Yeah. The market makers, like at the options exchange, make options with certain strikes. They'll do a strike of 200, 201, 202. Yeah. And that way you can buy it wherever you want it. Think of it as being setting up like the gambling machine. 
and they're setting it up so you can pick which option you want to bet right. on. You know? um, so, for example, if the stock market starts at 250 and I think it's going to drop to 200 a $200 put option, a strike of 200 put option might be really, really cheap because it has to drop by 20% to get there. So you might only pay 20 cents or something for each share that you bought. Right. And in reality, when it hits all the way down to it, it might be worth like eight bucks or something. So you're going, I risk 20 cents and made $8. And so the idea then is if you do it right, if you're pretty confident the market's going to go down by, say, whatever percent, which I can put on my spreadsheet there, then you go, then that's how far down I know to put my strike price. And that's a reasonable estimate. Yeah, based on the past. Based on what we have seen as a pattern in the past. Yeah, right. All right, fair enough. And that's it. That's it. So what are... um, as some actionable items people could do for purchasing or looking and learning into figuring out which put options to purchase. Okay. So the first thing is if you bring back up the graph, uh, or I'm sorry, my Excel sheet. Oh, okay. Give me a sec. Let's go here, sir. Okay. Um, you can see then that the percent fall of the S and P 500 in column I from start to finish. Yeah. Oh wait, I'm sorry. That's the wrong one. Um, <clears throat> that's from the start of the recession to the finish of the recession. If you look in column K, it says the percent fall from the highest to the lowest. This is actually taken from an article on Seeking Alpha. Yeah, let's look at that <clears throat> article right quick. But wait, before you go there, notice the average drop that is 33%. That means you expect the stock market to drop 33%. So that would be your you putting in, in the put option. A strike, a strike 33%, 33. 33% lower than where it is now. Gotcha. Interesting, man. Let's look at that right quick. I keep uh, opening a new tab back here somehow. I don't know why it does that. When does a recession accompany a stock market correction? And when does it not? So what did you find in here that was... That the average recession length is about 33%. There you go. Gotcha. There you see the percent decline of each of the recessions. So the average is about 33%. And the standard deviation, though, when I took the numbers in, they didn't put it in there. I did it. To calculate the standard deviation, it was like 16%, which means that on average, about 70% Yeah, you know of the why time, they didn't do it? Because they're probably going to sell that to someone, right? Yeah, because that's standard deviation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the grunt work that you did. Yeah. Sweet, man. So that means you're looking at about 17% to 33 plus 16, which would be 49%. So how would somebody then be looking up which put options to invest so in. So that now this is where it depends on your risk profile. If you go, hey, I just want to make some money to make sure I'm okay, you should put some, what was it, 33 minus 16, which is 17%. Put some 17% beneath the current current price. That's where you should put your strike. Then put some 33% beneath, and then put some That's so you put less money in the higher... In the higher risk, risk ones. Risk. But you're almost guaranteed to make some money because it's going to hit through 17%. So I see what you're saying. So you're buying put options, but different strike that's right. Prices with different strikes, and, so and once I'm being very conservative, it, that you mm-hmm. know, you're like, ah, for sure, it's going to happen. I'm going to make some a little bit of money. So maybe you put exactly. bulk of your investment in there because exactly. it's low risk. Because you know you're going to make some money, and then more and more as you say, uh, more aggressive. Basically, you're being exactly. and saying, I think the economy is going to go even shittier than what it is now. Right? <laughs> right. Essentially, was what, what you're claiming. That's exactly right. Okay. Wow. That's awesome, man. Thank My you. My prediction returns about four hundred percent. Dang, Brad. We'll see if it works. Well, if we come back in about a year and a half and uh, well, we'll definitely do a follow up you yeah, know, sure. episode to see how things go uh, throughout 2019. Absolutely. Um, and as you keep coming back here, because, you know, you're guest number one and forever. Guest number one. That's Dude, right. You're zero, I get like zero. a golden key or something. Oh, shoot. <laughs> oh, I forgot my golden key. Oh, golden key. Darn it. I knew I missed something <laughs> today. Right. That's cool. So that's it. Right. So the walk away from what people can do, essentially what we're saying, um, we're, and again, not not saying that you should invest your money in anything. We're not recommending you to do anything. What we basically discovered and talked about today um, was essentially based on the graph that we saw earlier, which is the 10-year treasury um, maturity rate. Yeah, between, between 10 three, year and three months. Yeah, three months and 10 years. And that graph is on a rapid decline, and it's about to hit zero. Yeah, now when it does, when it you does, back the Excel sheet? Uh-huh. I'm still looking for one exact thing. Does that thing have a second page on it, like further over, or is that it? Yeah, there's... Uh, Can I see the... I actually don't know if there's a second page on it, man. Huh. Because I knew there was a thing... Oh, wait, here it is. Time, column R. Time between the high of the market and okay. when the recession starts. 
Now, I'm also looking for there was the time between the hot between the bond divergence equaling zero and the high because you got to know when to go ahead and make the play. I'm going okay if the divergence is zero on January first. How many how many months do you want me to wait before I go ahead and do the thing? Right, exactly. So could you scroll over? I know there's a thing in there. It's supposed to be the amount of time between the divergence and the high. Okay, so that's just the length of it. So keep going. Highest point, Highest point date, date minus, minus bond divergence date. That's it. I knew it was in there somewhere. Of course. So it's there it is. Bradley put it in there. I was like, dude, <laughs> I don't play. Yeah. I ain't playing around here, son. Right. I don't play around, kid. <laughs> <laughs> why? I don't know why the 1940s showed up, but whatever. Sorry, whatever. It's I fun. We're having fun. Look at our divergence, see? That's right. So column D then has the dive time between when the divergence hits zero yeah. and when you're actually at the highest point in the S&P 500, according to every other historical recession. And so its average is 6.4 months, but the standard deviation is almost six months, which means within a month after it happens, after you hit zero, you could be at your highest point. We can't say for perfectly sure, but if you want to make the play sooner rather than later, right. you might want to wait more than a month or two after the divergence hits zero. Now, when it does, then scroll back over a little bit more to the right. Then you could say that on average, the thing is going to fall about 30%. Here's two different ways I calculated it in columns K and Q. 31 to 33%. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so standard deviations are right around 15-ish percent. Right. So then you should automatically set your drops at 15, 30, and 45. And that would be a good... That's where the strikes are beneath so the current meaning value. meaning that 15, a strike of 15 on your put option mm -hmm. should be... Fifteen percent lower. Yeah, which should be a bulk of the investment to yeah, keep to it low safe. risk to be That's safe, right. and then thirty, and then thirty, and then forty-five. Because I'm taking each one, rounding them, and going, give me one standard deviation away, the wow. average, and two standard deviations Incredible. away. And then, so if you go a little bit to the left again, how long did it actually last? The recession lasted about one year, according to column F. Right. And the standard deviation was about four months. Um, I thought I had a high estate to minus low estate. If you go a little bit further to the left. Uh, hold on. Do you see? I think it's this, right? The first one, no? No, I don't think that's it. High minus bond divergence. What's false divergence signals? Oh, those are data oh. pieces that were skewed and taken out? Though they actually went through zero and did not give you a recession correctly. Every recession has been preceded by a divergence, but there have been two cases in history whenever the thing hit zero, but you didn't get into a recession right away. You had to wait longer. You think that could also happen this time? Honestly, no, because it seems so clearly self-evident. There's no geopolitical thing that's making it do what it's doing. It's just naturally reaching the end of its cycle. Huh. Now, but then it's so, okay. So you can see clearly that the length of the thing was in years was one year plus or minus about 0.36. Now, the problem I'm having is this is, I'm sorry, this is the actual recession start to recession end. Could you go all the way to the right one more time? Sure. All right, so here you go. A time between the high and the low in months and column N. N. And <clears throat> so you go, okay, that means right after it hits zero, then you should go look within about a month or two, and that's going to be the time. You put your strikes 15, 30, and 45% down from where the current value is. That's how far your price point is. And how long between when you hit that high point, do you actually hit the low point? And now you're watching the stock market every month to just see how high and low it is. Right. And so the time on average is about 11 months, standard deviation six and a half. So that means a really short recession might hit the bottom of the S&P within five and a half months or so. And then otherwise, within about 18 months. How, how can you get close? That's where you have to read the situation right then. You have to go, okay, are things still bad? Are people not buying things yet or whatever? Okay, so how can somebody who doesn't know enough, mm -hmm. like, you know, they're just starting out, they may be listening to what we're talking about, and it's making good enough sense, and they want to educate themselves enough to understand when to sell and when to, you know, sure. pull the trigger based on the information that we've already provided. Right. What would be in your recommendation a couple of things that somebody could do to, um, you know, get themselves up to speed or, you know, on all that? To learn a little more about how the a little bit more working. and be able to, so you know, have an informative on decision on their yeah. own. Because the thing is, you have, they, anybody listening to this, you know, you guys have to do your due diligence on it for sure. Right. You guys have to, like, do your part to make sure that it makes all sense to you can't do anything just blindly right sure. especially if it's your money but but with that being said i definitely want to provide um something that so that could be of you know value that they can read up that you think right be so, the appro more most appropriate so to speak. right so if you want just the main you want to make sure you understand how the information works yeah 
Uh, first thing I do is watch How the Economy Works by Ray. Ray Dalio. Yeah, that's that's right on YouTube. Right on YouTube. Free. Um, so you understand how the boom and bust cycles work. And he okay. really does. He goes up to the level of the federal government and shows how printing more money does this and changing interest rates does that. And so understand so fundamentally how the market clean. is. Yeah, beautiful stuff. Great. And so once you've got that, you have an idea of what's going on. You understand <clears> the framework you're playing yeah. in. I would at least glance through the conclusion on the Fred. There's a paper there okay. that actually shows the 10-year minus three-month thing, and there's their proof of it. Beautiful. Right. And then you go, okay, now I understand how this works as a divergence. The next thing would be probably to go on Infopedia. And, I'm sorry, Investopedia. Investopedia? Never yeah, heard of it. Um, it's, it's like a Wikipedia thing, but for like finance stuff. Awesome. <clears throat> and while you're there, Google things like put option, call option, um, inverse fund. And just knowing the terms that we've even used would really help you get a grip on, okay, I see what they're talking about now. Yeah. Because if we're using words you understand, of course you're not going to get it. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to have to revisit yeah, a lot of this conversation and sure. actually, you know, It's a little it. jargony, right? Well, I mean, that's to make we're money doing the people, best that we can. Yeah, but that's to make the money people, the money people would make you think you can't do it. You yeah, know, honestly, it is. Uh, what is it? My favorite Tony Robbins quote is, complexity is the enemy of execution. That's right, yeah. When people think <laughs> everything is so hard, they think they can't do anything. Yeah, they can't so do anything. So you got to break so it down paralyzed. to something that's digestible and it makes sense and you're willing to take an action yep. towards it. You know, and I think Definitely. that's key. So I think I think we've really done that today. At Feels least like it. I'm I happy. feel like I right. think I think I understood quite a bit. To be honest yeah. with you, like sitting down on this chair today, I didn't expect. I mean, we did this completely wrong. We didn't plan oh, sure, we this. know. No. Um, so I definitely feel a little bit more confident. Uh, do your due diligence. I'm doing going to do mine for sure. You know, I think and this and is make sure. Good. Remember, guys, we're not telling you to do yeah. this. We are not giving you financial advice. Neither of us is certified as a for financial sure. anything. Yes. You know, this is just my idea of what I'm going to do based upon what I see in the world. And yep. you can believe me, or if it doesn't work for you, don't believe me. It's entirely. Yeah, you're just like a really smart person. It's sure, all right. It doesn't really matter. Right. Why should we smart? <laughs> don't say that. They'll expect results. I'm not expecting <laughs> anything. I'm just saying because I, I don't know. Anyway. Um, okay. We should wrap this thing up. Yeah, I think this so. was a good episode. This what do you good. think? We should we should talk like a little bit before we go. Sure. Uh, let's let's. I think you had a really good idea, and that I can try to incorporate in these podcasts is how can we give people something to take away maybe like a bullet point summary type of thing mm-hmm. you know so today i think we talked about a few things we talked about relationships we talked sure. about how actually it's difficult because a lot of conversations that we have day to day are very surface right right and you need to be able to probe somebody a little bit deeper and i think people i, I don't know that would be my takeaway would be like if you're trying to get into a relationship with somebody you need to f- orient yourself first right that's number one and maybe just as a way to make sure you're orienting yourself correctly, I would say yeah. think of relationships as being like a layer cake. Yeah. Don't confuse that base layer of infatuation with common goals or vice versa. Make sure you know what you're getting and what you're going after. Yeah. When those two are in line, you're going to be just fine. Be clear on what it is be you clear. want. Sure. Yeah. If you like raw chemistry, that's not the same thing as saying they have the same views on children or futures or retirement as I do. That's not the same thing. Yeah. So know what it is that you're going after. Know what it is that you, what you want and where you are. Right. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay, so that's number one. And then I think we then started to get into, you know, the economy definitely seems like it's about to do a, a yeah, downturn. It's you know, it's getting right. there. It's on everybody's mouths. It's all, everywhere you turn in terms of finance, that's predicted. Mm-hmm. Now, we looked today through the data of all the past crashes in the last 70 plus years. And from what we saw, the trend, it seems like there's correlation to be found between the uh fred graph which is the treasury's three to ten month three uh ten three to, months to ten compared to ten years yeah to ten years um basically distribution mm-hmm. of of how the economy is doing right and that's about to hit zero and when it does we believe from the patterns between four months to thir- four and a half months to 13 months roughly speaking the right. economy will be in a in a, a depression. About that. So you should probably wait no more than a month or two before yeah. you make the move. And at that point, if you are a low-risk investor, you can invest in things like um, the two things, two stock you options. You can invest in, in what are called an inverse fund. In, inverse fund. Like the triple Q. Yep. I'm sorry, PSQ is an inverse and fund. An inverse fund essentially is yeah. just taking the current economy and yeah. betting against it potentially, that's right? Exactly so that's, right. that's all you're doing there. Um, and if you want to be a little bit more... Um, getting asymmetrical risk reward, you have to look into things like put options, call, buying put options, buying put options uh, call options, and the third word was in inverse. Something. Oh, you're just looking for things that move inverse, inverse in, funds. Inverse funds. Yeah, just look for those things. Um, 
pretty good way of judging yeah, whether, it's a very whether or not. Way. Yeah, and I think, and that's a good way to take advantage of the situation, you know, rather than right. being a victim to what's happening around yeah. you. You're either take, on the you boat know, or take, you're uh, in the yeah, waves. For sure. Which one do you want? Take, take it, take it. Yeah, I'm with you, man. Yeah. Well, wow, this has been really fun. It was awesome. I had this is awesome, man. <laughs> We should do this again. Anytime you want. Yeah, this is great. Thanks, everybody, who uh, hung out with us for... God, it's been a long time. Do you have, like, fake applause now? Some yeah, sh- no, I don't have any of that shit, man. So. <laughs> All right, let me cut this thing out of here. Right. I really hope that you enjoyed this episode. Again, remember, we have video components to each of these podcasts that exist on YouTube. You can simply search for Blossom Media Studio or The Real Abinov. Either way, you'll find the episodes that you need. And see you next time.